Hello and welcome to Tau Capes, the podcast that covers film, television, comics, and games. I am your host, Cody Nestor, and alongside me is my co-host, Todd Heal. What's up, guys? Uh, the video version of today's episode is available on YouTube. If you enjoy the show, please consider following us on your podcast platform of choice and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Today, we're talking about Five Nights at Freddy's. A troubled security guard begins working at Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. While spending his first night on the job, he realizes the late shift at Freddy's won't be so easy to make it through. Five Nights at Freddy's was released in theaters and streaming on October 27th. On a budget of $20 million, it has made $154 million at the time of recording. It has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 29% and an audience score of 88%. Pretty much the complete opposite of last week's film when Evil Lurks, which was loved by critics and not really embraced by audiences. Right. This is the exact opposite, Todd. So let's talk non-spoilers. So, Todd, would you recommend people watch Five Nights at Freddy's? I personally would not. And why is that, Todd? I just I just didn't get it. Uh, now I know, <laughs> you know, I got some age on me, folks. Uh, I'm not really familiar with this property other than my granddaughter plays this game, okay. or she used to, and right. I know it from her. Uh, she watched it a couple nights earlier this week, and I asked her if she liked, and she's like, "Yeah." So it's you look at that audience score; it, it's finding this target audience, but I obviously ain't that target audience. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not either. I mean, uh, you know, full disclosure, I'm I'm like you. I have not played. I was familiar and knew of the existence of the Five Nights at Freddy's games. It's never a series that I played personally. So I I am kind of curious. Um, you know, that's kind of the first anecdote I have of anybody that, that's known anybody that's played the games and enjoyed the games and also seen the film. But I mean, I'm I'm with you, you know, speaking to others like us that are not familiar with Five Nights at Freddy and its lore, I would say if you already have Peacock and it looks interesting to you, sure, go ahead and give it a watch. But if you don't have Peacock or it doesn't look that interesting to you, skip it. Yeah, I would echo that. Yeah. So that's it for non-spoilers. Uh, spoilers from here on out. But before we discuss the film in detail, it's time to play another round of How Many Stars, Todd. Oh, I love this one. So I have five audience reviews for Five Nights at Freddy's here. I will read your review and, t- and you tell me from one to five how many stars you think the person gave the film. Again, there are no half-star reviews. No halves. Stephanie B. says, The actors were great. The costumes also great. Wish there was more gore, but it was appropriate for children because there wasn't any. The kids loved it. How many stars? I want to say three. Four stars. Dang. The Batman 514 says... I like this dude already. Yeah. Explaining why this should be considered good is why it's terrible. First 15 minutes gave me hope, and I had zero expectation. This makes The Flash look like a great movie. Shake in my fucking head. How many stars? (laughs) One. Two stars, actually. Oh, God. He's a little generous. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Ayala says, Great practical effects on the animatronics. Great set design but not the best dialogue. Overall, an enjoyable watch, though. How many stars? I'm going to go back to my three here. Three stars? Yeah, I got one, baby. Tanner L. says, The movie was a thrilling adaptation of the games and worked hard to make sure it captured as much of the first game as possible while still leaving room for follow-up movies. Sure, there were some changes, but it made it all the better. Uh, If I better understood the franchise and those who played uh, it on... uh, if I better understood the franchise and those who played it on their YouTube channels, I'd probably have seen a lot more references and Easter eggs than I did, but still a good movie. How many stars? Five. Five stars? Hey! Nice. Keith says, Having played the game with my grandson, I expected a much scarier movie, jump scares, tense moments like the game. We didn't get any of these. Five Nights at Freddy's reminded me of a Disney movie with some adult content and a few curse words thrown in. Not recommended. How many stars? Two. Two stars. Oh, nice. I finished strong. Yes. Good job, pal. Uh, so now let's talk about Five Nights at Freddy's. For those that may not know, like Todd and I, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's is based on a video game series created by Scott Cawthon. The first video game was released on August 8, 2014, and the resulting series has since gained worldwide popularity. 
The main series consists of nine video games taking place in locations connected to a fictional family pizza restaurant franchise named Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. After its mascot, the animatronic bear Freddy Fazbear, in most games, the player assumes the role of a nighttime employee who must utilize tools such as security cameras, lights, doors, and vents to defend themselves against the animatronic characters who inhabit the location and become mobile and hostile at night. With that said, Todd, walk us through the opening of the film. Uh, so we're first introduced to a security guard. He's working overnight at the old abandoned Freddy Fosbear's Pizzeria. We see him uh, captured. He's strapped into some type of device, uh, getting ready to get his face mangled, mm-hmm. kills him. Uh, flash forward a little later, we're introduced to uh, Mike. Mike Schmidt, I think his name was. You know, I don't even, it is Mike Schmidt, yeah, yeah actually. Uh, he's actually a mall security guy. He actually winds up getting fired because he chases down a guy and beats him up because he thought he was kidnapping his own kid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, we didn't see Mike at his kind of career supervisor's office. His name was Steve Raglan. Uh, he offers, offers him a job at that same pizzeria, you know, being the night security guy. He first kind of refuses it, but then he realizes he needs that job because he's in a custody battle or getting ready to be in a custody battle for his younger sister that lives with him, Abby. Uh, His aunt's trying to take her away, so he's like, I got to take the job. Yeah, absolutely. And then, uh, you know, for for, uh, Freddie Fazbear's Pizzeria, you know, kind of think Chuck E. Cheese meets a showbiz pizza place from hell. Yeah. That's pretty much what (laughs) Freddie Fazbear's Pizzeria is. And you mentioned uh, Steve Raglan, his kind of career counselor, played by uh, Matthew Lillard. Of course, Scream alum, Stu Mocker in uh, the Scream films. Um, Did you kind of figure he would come back at some point, Todd? You kind of th- got to thinking that, you know, that's a pretty big name just to be like a throw-off counselor. Right, so. exactly. I was like, well, I mean, the ending of this film was actually spoiled for me by TikTok, but that's not here or there, there but I figured he would come back at some point. Uh, so do you realize we watched three Josh Hutcherson films this week, Todd? I did until I started this thing, and uh, he was, like, you know, getting up out of bed, and I was like, shit, there's Peter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, we watched this film and the first two Hunger Games uh, this week for Popcorn Mumbles. I- I'm getting kind of hutched out. <laughs> Uh, so during his first night at Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, Mike falls asleep and he dreams about his brother Garrett's kidnapping. So that's kind of Mike's magic, uh, um, tragic backstory here. So when he was 12, he witnessed his brother's abduction. It's kind of set up in, in the film that Mike kind of medicinally induces sleep to kind of search his dreams for clues about his kidnapped brother. Uh, in his dream, he begins to see five children, but when Mike tries to kind of approach them, they, uh, you just all kind of see him scatter and run away from him. Uh, so on the second night he's there, Mike has the same dream, but when he attempts to confront one of the children, he is attacked and uh, causing him to kind of startle awake. And he also notices there's that from where he was attacked, he's got like kind of like an injury on his arm, uh, Freddy Krueger style. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, he Mike uh, Mike meets with a police officer Vanessa Shelley, who notices his wounds. She bandages him up, fixes him up, and she uh, kind of shows him around the restaurant. Tells him that it was closed in the '80s because a bunch of kids got abducted. I don't know about you, but I was immediately kind of sus about Vanessa. Yeah, she seemed a little sketchy. She's kind of way too enthusiastic about that old busted up pizza joint and yeah. those animatronics. She's like, "Hey, look at this!" Yeah, and she she knows too much about the place and the animatronics. Like you know, like she's got more backstory to her you know it's it's pretty just in your face that like this girl knows more than she's letting on uh mike's whole reason for taking the job like you said is uh to look good in the eyes of the court to kind of keep uh, abby away from his uh, aunt jane mike has a babysitter named max that kind of watches abby during the day or during the nights uh, when he works at uh, freddie fazbear's uh, while he works uh so you know right before um things kind of took a turn with max i was like you know, good on this girl for helping out this basket case of a man, you know, with watching out, you know, watching this kid for him. But yeah. no, nah, that thought was short lived, Todd. <laughs> uh, tell us about the plot that Max is a part of. So she's kind of involved with this gang that gets hired by Aunt Jane to uh, kind of go in and trash the pizza place after Mike leaves, kind of make it look like he's negligent in his job, uh, mm. hopefully to get him fired. So it'll kind of make her uh, court case trying to win back the sister a little bit more easier to win. Yeah. Uh, the gang actually does break in, starts trashing the place, and gets eliminated by the animatronic animals. Yeah, so the mascots we've got, we've got Freddy Fazbear, uh, Bonnie, uh, I think that's the blue one, right? I believe so. Chica is like the the yellow kind of chicken. chicken. Yeah. Uh, Foxy, 
obviously we know which that one looks like, and Mr. Cupcake, which is the one that uh, Chica holds all the time in its hand. Yeah. Uh, they kind of come alive. They slaughter the group. Um, and, you know, Max's kind of disappearance kind of forces Mike to bring – Abby along the next time he's on shift there at the pizzeria. But right. Did any of the kills inside the pizzeria when we first kind of see the animatronics kind of come to life and, and kill that little gang of uh, uh, people that break in, any of those kills stand out to you? I, I guess maybe the only one was that little cupcake kind of gnawing on that guy's face. And other than that, they're kind of a little uh, not so good. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Like you do see kind of that guy's mangled face because it's like, there's um, two guys that are kind of in the kitchen. There's Max, and then Max is, I think it's her brother, maybe. I think so, yeah. Uh, and the one guy gets mangled by the cupcake in the floor of the kitchen. The other one kind of gets chased down. Uh, I guess for me, I guess the one that stands out the most is, I guess, Max getting, like, chomped in half, I suppose. But it's it's PG-13, so it's, like, just kind of done in shadows on the wall. Right. Um, you know, I don't know. It's just they're... They're okay, but again, it's PG thirteen, and it's just it's not what I would look for like in a, in a film with this kind of premise. I, I kind of want the the violence and the stuff, but this is not, I guess, not that type of franchise, and or, or at least not for us adults. Yeah, and again, there may have been things in those kills that uh, fans of the game would have picked up as like Easter eggy stuff, but I just you know have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I think the chompy is like the chomp and yeah. have, but again, we have no idea. Right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for that, but yeah, we just don't know. Uh, yeah. Um. So on the third night, um, we see uh that the animatronics come alive and they kind of befriend Abby. Uh, but they're kind of hostile towards Mike. He kind of like walks over and like Fazbear like cuts the eyes at him real quick kind of thing. Yeah. Um, he kind of then discovers through the story that the uh, the animatronics are possessed by the ghosts of the missing children, whose leader is the young blonde boy that you kind of see throughout his dreams. And that and that blonde kid usually he kind of consistently mentions a yellow rabbit, which will kind of come back during the ending of the story. Right. But this is an element that I didn't care for. Again, maybe it's this way in the games. I don't think it is from my understanding, but I would have rather had the animatronics remain hostile the entire time, at least up until the ending. Like, it's just, you kind of lose a little bit of the creepiness that they had from the animatronics when you just kind of see them building a fort. Right. With the little girl, you know what I mean? You kind of, That's the only thing this movie has going for it is those animatronics and the little bit of creepiness they have. And it's kind of thrown out the window halfway through when they're just like, yeah, let's have a good fun time and build this fort. Mm-mm. I just kind of, I mean, am I crazy? Would you just rather, would, would you have rather kind of seen them just kind of remain hostile until maybe the ending when things, you know, kind of work out the way they work out? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, other than those scenes where their eyes kind of get red and, you know, they're gotten written they, you know, they're switched to kill mode. Yeah, they switch to kill switch on them. Uh, they just kind of look like just kind of you know cuddly looking creatures. Am I am I wrong here? <laughs> no, I mean I mean I, think, I mean obviously that's the intention. You know, they're made for to entertain kids and everything. But yeah, and then like I said, they're they're hostile until they befriend Abby, and then it's like okay, it's kind of some of the threats kind of taken away. If it was just them being threatening through the whole film, I think it would have been a little bit better to me, but. Maybe it's an element of the game. We don't know. But I think in the games, they were just kind of hostile all the way out through. I think so, too, yeah. yeah. From what I've heard, yeah. So uh, during that uh, fourth night, uh, Abby is accidentally injured when she, Mike, and Vanessa are kind of bonding with the animatronics. Abby just, like, rocks too hard and strums <laughs> one of the guitars and gets blown across the room. Marty McFly style, right Yeah, there. exactly. <laughs> Uh, Vanessa learns Mike is attempting to identify Garrett's kidnapper and warns him not to bring Abby to the restaurant again. She actually says, if you do, I'll shoot you, Ooh. which pretty sus. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mike gets Jane, uh, uh, Aunt Jane, to babysit Abby, much to her frustration, as he goes back to the restaurant during the day and overdoses on sleeping pills, again, trying to calm his dreams to make contact with their children and also kind of learn details about his brother's kidnapping. Uh, on the fifth night, the children appear in Mike's subsequent dream and tell him that he can stay with Garrett forever in exchange for Abby. The little creepy children want Abby. Mm. 
Uh, Mike initially accepts their proposal, but when he changes his mind, he is attacked and wakes up strapped to the torture device. So it's kind of like, I guess, one of the animatronic masks kind of like mounted, and it's just kind of coming straight at your face right. to kind of gnaw you up, I guess, or to turn you into one of them potentially, Possibly, which maybe yeah. we, we'll talk about a little bit later on. Uh, he escapes the device by removing the pins that uh, that security guard, kind of his predecessor in the chair you mentioned before, right. had loosened, uh, and he gets kind of wounded by Foxy. It's like the second or third time we see like Foxy like scuttle down that hallway. <laughs> Did that have you just pissing your pants in fear, Todd? Uh, no pants pissing here. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Foxy is actually the only character, if I'm not mistaken, with a voice. You can kind of hear Foxy kind of like humming before he kind of attacks. Yeah. Uh, the rest kind of just lip sync to uh, the songs that they're programmed to. What's the song? What's the main song in the movie? Um, uh, what is it? Something in the night. Oh, I can't remember. Oh, I have to look it yeah, up. That's going to bother me. I know, right? It's going <laughs> to bother me the whole rest of the time. Uh, was it Walking in Your Sleep? That's it. Walking in Your Sleep. I hear yeah. the sick. Yeah. That's We're it. back, yeah. baby. Yeah. That's <laughs> it. Yeah. That they're, they sing that. Uh, I'll sing no more. I don't want to be monetized. Is that right? <laughs> Uh, but, uh, yeah, they kind of pre-programmed. They, the rest of them just kind of limp seek to that song or into it, another song that I forget what it is. But anyway, meanwhile, a damaged, uh, yellow Freddy animatronic, uh, possessed by that blonde boy, uh, kills Jan when he goes to their little house and apartment and takes Abby back to the restaurant in a taxi. Mm. I really dislike that taxi scene, Todd. Yeah, nothing about that scene made any sense whatsoever. Yeah, so to set it up, so Abby goes outside and she jumps in a taxi and the guy just goes, we're too little girl. So my thing is, first off, if you're an Uber driver or a taxi driver and like a 12-year-old girl gets into your taxi, unaccompanied minor gets into your taxi, are you just going to be like, go with it and be like, we're too little lady? <laughs> are you going to ask a couple fucking questions? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't I'd be an Uber driver and just start driving some kid around, would you? No. It makes no sense. But anyway, that gap in logic. Uh, but then we get Freddy Fazbear coming out and climbing his fat ass in the car and then just kind of weighing it down. And it's like it's there for humor. It's there to be like a little humorous moment of, ha, 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 look at this big-ass animatronic in the back of this taxi. Isn't this unusual? Yes, it is, and it's terrible. Yes, right. It's so unusual, it doesn't work. Yeah, it does. Did that Did that scene have you pissing your pants in laughter, Todd? Uh, no more pissing here either. Yeah, so you just pissed yourself <laughs> because you're old and you have bladder control issues? Yeah, that's the only reason I do it, folks. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, all right, Todd, so take us through the ending of the film. Okay, let me see if I got the breath for all this. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, Vanessa comes upon Mike and uh, finds out he's been injured. She treats those injuries, and uh, she kind of comes clean about why she's been so sketchy throughout this whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, she tells Mike that her father is actually that serial killer that killed those five kids back in the day at the pizzeria. Yeah, William Afton. Yeah. And the reason they never found any bodies is because they were stashed in the one place. Who the hell would think to look? They're in the animatronics. Right, right. They ain't just haunted. Them kids is in there. Right. Which is a creepy kind of element. I, I did. I was kind of like kind of put off a little bit by the possession of the animatronic angle. But like it was kind of a little bit of a nice little added bonus that they're like, oh, he put the bodies in the animatronics right. too. That, that was cool. I'll give it that. So when they realize that uh, Abby's life is in danger as they're possibly wanting to turn her into one of those animatronics and keep her forever, uh, Mike rushes back to the pizzeria. Uh, Vanessa kind of gives him some tips on how to take out the creatures, you know, electric shocks, you know, tasers. Yeah, he's got a taser. He's got like a cattle prod with him. Right, cattle prod. I forgot about the cattle prod. Uh, let's see. He gets back to the pizzeria. He manages to dis disable a couple, I think, with the cattle prod and some water, was it? Yeah, he like to, he there. There's like two on the stage. I think again doing a, their performance of walking in your in your sleep, right? Up on the stage because I guess that's what they do when no yeah. one's around watching. They still <laughs> perform, and he takes like a bucket of water and kind of throws it on the stage. And I think uses the I think he uses the taser. Yeah, I think you're right. And like uses the taser to kind of like electrify them in the water and kind right. of puts those two out of commission. It's the blue one. I think Bonnie and it's Fazbear. Is the two he takes out first. Yeah, and I think Foxy kind of gets away, and he sh she's kind of chasing after Abby, and Abby gets in the ball pit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, long story short, they kind of all get disabled, and mm -hmm. then Vanessa kind of shows up back at the pizzeria along with her dun-dun-dun, yellow rabbit-suited dad. Yeah. Now, the, the, the yellow rabbit 
reveal the suit and everything, I thought that was yeah, the way it looked, I thought was real cool. It was. I will give it that. I will give it that. And uh, the old yellow suited, rabbit suited dad reveals itself to be uh, not just Vanessa's father, but uh, Mike's uh, career counselor. Yeah, Mr. Steve Raglan. That's again. right. Yeah. Here's Matthew Lillard coming back. He is indeed uh, Abby, or not Abby's father, but Vanessa's father, William Afton. He's our serial killer. He's the one that killed those five children. And he's also the one that we learned that also abducted and killed Mike's brother, Garrett. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, what else we got here? Uh, so basically, you know, they're kind of like fighting with him a little bit. I think he kind of, uh, reignites or, uh, kind of gets the other animatronics back up and going. Right. Um, he's got some kind of power or control over them somehow. And that's why Abby yes. starts drawing that picture. Yeah. So like Abby's kind of set up during the film. She's like, she, that's all. She doesn't really talk too much. She just loves to draw. Um, and there's a bunch of drawings on the wall of, like um, kind of drawings that were put there by, by kids that, that kind of paint the yellow rabbit in a good light right. to the other animatronics. Cause like you said, he does have some kind of influence over their minds to like make them do the things that they're doing. Yeah. So they, the way that uh, uh, Stu Mocker's defeated <laughs> is uh, Abby kind of draws a picture and hangs it on the wall for the animatronics to see the yellow rabbit is not good. She draws like a picture of like the yellow rabbit showing him like murdering all of them as children. Yeah. Basically and kind of hangs it on the wall and that kind of triggers them to be like, oh yeah, this guy's an asshole. He killed all of us. We should do something about that. Yeah. So they set upon him basically from that point. And might I add it's it was nice to see, although it wasn't as long, a nice little uh, Matthew Lillard like uh meltdown frothing, uh, slobbering kind of right <laughs> scene a la scream. Yeah, exactly. that was cool. <laughs> yeah, the uh I have it as a note later, but I'll just put it in here. But my favorite part of this entire film involves him and he's got like a he's got a big ass knife in this, like a almost buoy knife size, and he does the uh kind of iconic scream knife white. Oh, yeah. In that, that's my favorite part of the movie, yeah. if that tells you anything about right. how much I enjoyed this film. But, yeah, so basically, um, you know, they, all the other animatronics, they kind of uh, go in and they start, uh, I think it's like they even, like, trigger his suit to start the spring locks yeah, inside of it. Yeah, and it starts clamping down on him and crushing him. And his ribs and stuff, yeah. So, like, they, they kind of turn on him. Uh, Mr. Cupcake bites off part of his suit, uh, and that's what triggers the internal spring lock. Right, so, right, yeah. Kind of in crush, in crushing his midsection, and it kind of fatally wounds him. Uh, they try to kind of drag him to the back room. Mike and Abby carry uh, a wounded Vanessa out. She's kind of like falls into a coma, and she's in the coma pretty much at the end yeah, of the scene. Yeah, she film. got stabbed by her dad, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, Mike and, and Abby, they kind of he kind of continues to look after her, and they kind of resume their normal lives pretty much is how we kind of wrap up the film. One more thing to, to note here before we kind of move on. So, uh, it's shown that, like, you know, kind of the scene you're talking about with Matthew Lillard and doing, like, the, the frothing at the mouth. Like, mm -hmm. he has this line about, you know, I always come back. From what I understand, that's, like, a, a, a iconic line from the game series. And he kind of puts the helmet back on, and that kind of uh, sends him into becoming uh, Springtrap, as I understand it, who oh, is, okay. like, a villain that features, I think, later on in the series, but it's like one of the main, I guess, antagonists at that point. He becomes Springtrap. That's my research, folks. That's all I can give you on Five Nights at Freddy's lore. I'm okay. I understand. And from <laughs> that's what that scene was what was spoiled for me and the TikTok is showing that I always come back, put on the helmet, now he's spring trap. Apparently that was a big moment for fans for of the Five Nights at Freddy's series, which absolutely fine, nothing against that. But, you know, that was what was kind of spoiled for me on uh on uh, TikTok and then kind of reading through the comments, I guess that was what he spring trapped now and I guess comes back later on in the series. Okay. And potentially with sequels, which we'll talk about for this film. All right. So, Todd, tell me what you liked about the film. Uh, you know, I thought the acting was on par. I mean, nobody really seemed to be phoning it in for, I guess, maybe the type of material they were working with. Right. Uh, you know, I thought the animatronics looked good. 
Maybe they could have been a little creepier, a little scarier, but for what they were, I thought they looked great. Yeah, that was a question I had for you, um, you know, about how the look of the, the film. The film, film looked great. The animatronics looked good. Uh, Jim Henson's Creature Shop, they did the uh, the uh, creation of the, the Freddy Fazbear animatronics. Again, their work is always top-notch. I thought all that stuff was fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I kind of talked about my favorite moment of the film already, which is the the knife wipe by, uh, you know, Mr. Lillard there. Um, what didn't you like about the film? Uh, you know, I don't want to be too harsh here because, like I say, I'm not very familiar with this property. Uh, to be honest, I thought maybe it could have been a little bit darker, maybe a little bit scarier. But right. at that point, you kind of have to weigh, are you losing what is really your target audience for this movie if you do that? Right. That's my only really big gripe. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It's again, I don't know that this film was for us in particular. I don't think we're the target audience. Like maybe an age or just the demographic in general that play the game and love the lore and like know a lot about this universe. Maybe we're not the target the target audience for it. Um, you know, I'll talk about it more when you get into our review. But I mean, I think it's it's fine. It's just kind of really. It's not for me. Uh, I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. It's just somewhere in the middle, kind of pretty much. Gotcha. Um, question, though, on the back of this, uh, would you have any interest in a sequel to the film? If it's on streaming that I'm already <laughs> subscribing to, right. I'll watch it. If yeah. I got to go to the movies and pay for it, uh, probably not. Yeah, agreed. Um, so I, I read that in January of 2023, uh, in an interview on the podcast Weekly MTG, Matthew Lillard did reveal that he had signed a three-picture deal with the studios, and this is like the best performing Blumhouse film ever. So cool. I, I, it's, it's safe to say it's, there'll be a sequel. Oh, they'll be back. They'll oh, be yeah. back. For sure. So did you see the little uh, mid credit scene? I did not. I didn't, okay. even, I didn't even know. What is the mid credit scene? So they go back to uh, that taxi guy again oh. and he's picked up another fare and it's that you remember that little thing that oh, kept showing I did up in see the locker that, the little clown looking thing yeah. that he keeps flipping his face around because it's always scaring people I did see that yeah and then at the very end there's a voice that starts spelling out words and it's like come find me hmm. and then it goes off so I'm sure fans probably know exactly that, what that is exactly and they lost their mind. I'm just like, okie dokie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's uh let's watch something else now. Right. No, I I did not I didn't hear the, the ending voice. I did see that many credit scene. I just yeah. forgot that I saw it with the little clown, just scared him in his car yeah. or whatever. Hilarious. As if you didn't get enough of that taxi earlier. Yeah. Let's bring it back for the, for the mid credits. All right. So let's move on to our final thoughts and review scores. We rank films on a 1 to 10 scale. Starting from 1, the ranks are torture, 2 is awful, 3 is bad, 4 subpar, 5 mediocre, 6 decent, 7 good, 8 great, 9 amazing, and 10 is a masterpiece. Todd, give us your final thoughts and review score for Willy's Wonderland. I mean Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> so uh, as me and Cody has both kind of reiterated throughout this uh show here today uh this really isn't our thing uh it's not my bag baby. that's right it ain't our bag baby uh not very familiar with the property uh like i said my granddaughter plays it uh she loved the movie so that kind of tells you where your demographic lies right here and i'm really really aged out of this i didn't want to be too critical or too harsh but on the same level i kind of have to cause this as i seize it mm -hmm. uh, i'm gonna give this movie a four which on our scale is subpar okay all right um so I said in our last episode that When Evil Lurks was the best horror film I've seen this year. Five Nights at Freddy's is the most forgettable horror movie I've seen this year. Fair. Uh, that's not to say that it's a bad film. It's not a bad film. It's also not a good film. It's just not for me. It's not for us. Like you said, I don't think we're the target audience. I don't right. think this is a, a film made for us, and that's perfectly fine. But again, you have to balance out your enjoyment of it versus is this kind of for you and then kind of being honest to what you thought of the film. Uh, I mean, it's a PG-13 horror film that doesn't deliver any real scares at all. Uh, I see it as a film that's going to do well with parents that want to take their kids or let their kids watch a spooky film, you know, quote unquote. I see it doing well in that kind of market. But 
for the rest of us, there are far better, more adult films out there with the same premise. Like I, I jokingly mentioned Willy's Wonderland. That's basically a Nicolas Cage film with this exact premise that came out a few years ago. I've heard about that. I've heard it's actually a little bit better scary-wise as this was. Exactly. So, again, this is not for us. For the true fans, I hope this film lived up to your expectations. I'm actually going to, surprisingly, I'm actually going to give a little bit better score than Todd here. Uh, but for me, I give Five Nights at Freddy's a 5 out of 10 which ranks it as mediocre. So, Todd, tell everyone how they could find us and stay up to date with us on social media. We are at Tau Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, uh, Tau Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at TauCapesPod at gmail.com. Uh, also, if you're so obliged, leaving us a five-star review on your podcast app of choice really helps the show. Be on the lookout for this week's Popcorn Mumbles, where we'll be talking about the 2012 film The Hunger Games, and its 2013 sequel, The Hunger Games Catching Fire. Tau Capes will return next week. We want to thank you so much for listening. Until next time, bye, guys. Later, y'all.